Hello and welcome to another episode of Disrupt Your Now, the show for entrepreneurs who are sick and tired of checking off the boxes. Tonight, our guest, Steve Gamlin, is not checking off anybody else's boxes, and he hasn't for a number of years. Steve helps his clients use visualization and humor, and one other thing, you can tell him I forget the third thing, to reach their goals in life. So Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Absolutely a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Looking forward to our conversation. Thanks. And, and I totally screwed up the three things that you use. So I want you to introduce yourself sure. and let the audience know about your background, how you got to where you are today. You got it. I'm uh, currently 56 years old, live with my beautiful wife, Tina, in the a small town in a little section of woods in New Hampshire on a dead end street off another dead end street. <laughs> so we're, but we got good Wi-Fi, So we're good. That sounds nice. Um, when I was 11 years old, I wanted to be a radio DJ because I saw a guy on TV named Dr. Johnny fever, who I thought was yep. the coolest human on the planet. I wanted to be a stand-up comedian because Steve Martin was huge at the time. I wanted to write my own books because my mom instilled the love of reading and writing and myself and my sister. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be a teacher of people, but not in the classroom. Because yeah. I had an amazing teacher named Mrs. Farron in fifth grade, who, whenever I finished my work early, she encouraged me to help out the other students. So essentially, she had me coaching other people mm. when I was 11 years old. And I absolutely loved it. So those are the four things. And I was visualizing even then before I even knew it was a thing. Yeah. I would walk around with my dad's old cassette recorder and do my own little radio shows with my my turntable. And oh, that's would, so cool. <laughs> I would talk in the grooves between the songs. And uh, <laughs> put it this way, back in the days of records, you can remember this too, how dizzy you would get trying to read the label as it was oh, going yes. around. Yes. And, and I remember my first cassette player too. So yeah. the little one that you walk around with the mic. Yeah, those yep. were the days. <laughs> yep. So over the past 45 years since then, I was on the radio for 10 years professionally. I was 14 years as a radio comedy writer and producer, seven years of stand-up comedy. I've written four of my own books, been part of five other collaborative books. Mm -hmm. And I've been, uh, this year, I celebrate 20 years as a keynote speaker and as a coach, helping people. I love that all four of those things from your childhood ended up coming together. And I'm sure people would go, oh, it's just coincidence, mistake, whatever. No, it's like... Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm really excited about you talking about with visualization, among other things. But before you start talking more about what you do, I want I want to tell the audience, I want to make sure that y'all pay attention to Steve when he talks about this stuff, because a lot of people will be like, oh, that's bullshit, you know, and I'm like, well, you sit there and imagine all these terrible things happening all the time, and that keeps you from doing something. So look at positivity and visualization as the inverse of that. Yeah. And a lot of people do. As soon as they hear visualization or law of attraction, they go, oh, woo-woo. And I said, exactly. well, okay. To yeah. a lot of people, it is woo-woo because mm -hmm. it's invisible. But here's the thing. Here's how I describe my style. I am blue-collar woo. Mm -hmm. Meaning I am a roll up your sleeves, do the work, grab the tools. Let's just do this and watch what happens. See, I know mm -hmm. all the science that's going on behind the scenes. Yeah. Huge fan of Dr. Joe Dispenza. I absolutely love his work. He and I talk about the same stuff. He talks about it from a scientific approach. And I talk mm -hmm. about it in a blue collar approach, meaning do this yeah. and be aware of what happens. So I just explain things in such a way that most people go, oh, that's it. Oh, well, I, I could do that. And, yeah. and then that's legitimately, that's my whole foundation of everything. I want to make this all so understandable for regular mm -hmm. everyday people, just like me. Well, and that goes along with my tagline, no gobbledygook. Yes, stop thank throwing you. around the jargon. Stop trying to impress people with all the big words that you know, because you think that'll make you look more important or make you be able to charge more. Yeah. You know, start talking with people instead of to them. Yeah, I absolutely love having conversations with people about mm -hmm. stuff like this. And and they don't even understand that I'm explaining this to them. You know, when I used to be mm -hmm. back in my networking days, I was uh, one of the area directors of BNI, Business Networking International, oh, yeah, here yeah. in New Hampshire. And I would love, you know, it's so awkward for a lot of people when they go networking. Mm -hmm. And I would just ask them, they say, so Steve, what do you do? I'm like, oh, we'll get to me. I said, and I'll always ask, who was your favorite person you got to help this week? What pain did you make go away for? someone this week what was your favorite moment this week did you have a conversation that really made you happy 
and I watch them light up and they're like, oh, da, 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 and this happened and this happened. I go, what happened after that? Oh my gosh, we went to lunch and we met this person and mm -hmm. all of these good things happened. And then they go, oh my gosh, I'm totally monopolizing the conversation. What do you do? And I just point at them and I go, this. <laughs> yeah. This and oh, by the way, oh, by the way, you were networking when you did, when you did, they, they were, people don't understand what networking is. Yeah. And they'll say, oh my God, I said, look how positive you just were. I said, it, mm -hmm. I don't even know the people you were talking about, but let me just tell you, you, you lit up when you were yes. saying that. Mm -hmm. And all you spoke about was this good, positive stuff and all these things that started to happen. I said, that's exactly what I teach people how to do, yeah. how to do it on purpose with purpose and be more intentional mm -hmm. with their time. Because how many people do we know that get up every single day and all they do is fight and complain and scream and cause drama and chaos on social media. Yeah. Oh. And, and what do they post? My life sucks. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. really? Then do something about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stop digging. You know, if, if you're worried about the hole being so deep that you can't get out of, put down your shovel. You're just digging a hole every single day. And yeah, that's it, right. That's where it goes. Well, OK, so I interrupted you a minute ago when when I told when I was telling the audience what I wanted them to pay attention to. So I'm sorry. Can you tell my ADD brain is taking over? Well, welcome to my ADHD brain. So there you go. They'll be friends. Yeah, we'll just bounce off of each other all night. Yeah. Um, so that's funny that you were an area director with BNI because I was a member of that for a while here locally. Yeah. 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 But but most people do think of networking. They think of going oh. and sitting down and trading business cards and all that. They don't tr think about the relationship side of it. Yeah. Well, most people do what I used to call stairway to heaven networking, which if you remember back in high school, the couple of dances I actually went to because I got two size 12 feet and they're both left. I can't dance <laughs> anyway. But what most people would go to a dance, the guys anyway, what would we do? We would walk in, find a couple people we knew, lean against the wall the whole night, have a little conversation, not be involved at all. But when we heard stairway to heaven get played at the end, we knew in eight minutes and two seconds we could leave. And that's what a lot of people do with networking. They just go yeah. find the couple of people they know. They go lean against the wall somewhere and they don't interact with anybody else. And somebody asks, how was the networking event? They go, oh, there was nobody there. There was no action. That is so no true. Going on. That is so, so, yeah, that's, so true. That's, that's what I used to call it. I'm like, yeah. oh my gosh, look at those people over there. They're stairway to heaven networking. <laughs> that's hilarious. I love that. I'm going to have to remember that. Well, you it. know, a minute ago, you were talking about the person, how they lit up. That's one thing I tell people that just in your day-to-day -day life, try to pay attention to like your gut. When do you get those feelings of like you're excited or, and it doesn't have to last for a long time, but just like this feeling. And conversely, when do you get those feelings like you're punched in the gut, like, oh, I got to deal with this again. And, and if we could pay more attention to those signs throughout our days, then it would really help us find our way in what we really love and, and what we really should be doing. And it sounds like you just learned that from such a young age. I did. It was actually from one of my grandfathers. I had, I had two really cool grandfathers. They were both very different people, but they each taught me something great. And my mom's dad, my, my Pepe, my grandfather on the French side, <laughs> he lived a lesson. He never actually verbalized it, but watching him, I picked it up and I still use it today. He's been gone for almost 15 years, but I still use it every day. Mm -hmm. Wherever you are, look around and identify even in the smallest of ways, how can I leave this situation a little better than I find it? Mm -hmm. And it could be picking up a piece of trash, holding a door open for somebody. Um, I, my favorite game in the world is called shopping cart rodeo, which is when I go to the grocery store, if I see a cart left oh. out somewhere, I don't go get all negative that somebody was lazy and left it there. Mm -hmm. I go rescue it which yeah. means it's good for my cardio. It's a few extra steps that day. Mm -hmm. And then I get to offer it to somebody else on their way in the store. And I go full on used car salesman. I go, excuse me, do you need a carriage? I, this one's a rescue from the parking lot. You'll <laughs> love it. The wheels hardly wobble and I've warmed up the grips for you. <laughs> That's funny. I love it. And they that. love it. Now they're happy and I'm happy. And yeah. The, and you know, the cars out there are happy because they don't have to get rolled into by cars. Exactly. We've had almost hurricane force winds up here recently. And some of these carts mm -hmm. are doing 15, 20 miles an hour down the parking lot. And they're going to wow. dent the car. So <laughs> whenever I do that mm -hmm. or, or just a compliment or something. I was at a store recently and uh, there was a woman behind me. And I didn't know. She scared the hell out of me. I went and grabbed four 
carriages from outside and I brought them in and put them into the corral and I didn't see her and she grabbed one and two aisles later, she turned the corner and she looked at me and she goes, you don't actually work here, do you? I said, no, I don't have a name tag or a vest. And she said, but you brought in all those carriages. I said, well, yeah. I said, you know, there was, they're, they're short staffed and I didn't want it to dent anyone's car. And she goes, that's really cool. I'm going to have to think of that next time I go to the store. Oh, and I'm fun. like, this Yay. but when she said, you don't, you actually don't work here, do you? <laughs> Just, I'm like, no. Isn't it funny though? How many people have like never seen anybody do something just because to be nice, just yeah. because they can do it. That is so funny. She yeah. probably, or a lot of people, maybe her, maybe she didn't, but a lot of people would have been like, what's wrong with him? Yeah. Why is he doing that? Yeah. My record is six. I got really long arms, but if I try a seventh one, one of them's going to get squirrely and get loose and oh, that's funny. I'll be chasing it down the parking lot. So six is my limit. They're hard to steer, but I can. So I can Pepe taught you unspoken to always leave things better than they were or to always give something. Yeah. And he didn't judge. If he saw someone in need, he would do something like if, if he was your neighbor and, and there was a bad storm and he was driving by and saw that a, a branch had broken a picket on your fence. He would go home. He was a lifelong carpenter. He would go home, get his little stubby pencil on his ear and a tape measure, oh. go back and measure it. He'd go to his workshop and make one. If he had the same color paint as your fence, he would paint the thing. Oh, uh, he and sounds he would go so fix sweet. your Yeah, he'd go fix your fence and you would never know that Al Dion had been there. Oh my gosh, he sounds so sweet. Yeah, he was my That's cute little old man. That's what I used how I used to refer to him. Like people would ask, How's Pepe doing? I said, Oh, he's my cute little old man. Oh, I just I love awesome. him to death. Yeah. That's awesome. So who did your other grandpa teach you? He was uh, more on the executive side. He worked for a big company that was uh, a linen cleaning company, like, you know, uniforms and yeah. safety mats and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he was an executive VP in Chicago for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And he would go to work, you know, he'd have the suit on, but he wouldn't go and park in the front. He would drive around back to where the physical plant was, okay. the soil room, which is the just the dirtiest, filthiest Mm -hmm. lowest paying jobs of the entire company. And he would walk in that door and greet everybody and treat everybody with respect. And in the middle of summer, if they were running behind it, it was 120 degrees down there. He'd yeah. be up in his office, take off his jacket, take off his tie, roll up his sleeves and go work side by side with those people. And he told me one time when I was about 17, he said, young man, first off, you treat everybody with, with respect. You don't look down on people. He said, second, your integrity is something you can compromise once. Mm. And you'll never have a hundred percent again. Wow. So choose wisely with your actions. And I love I, that. I remember that from him. I'm getting teary eyed. They both sound amazing. You're so lucky that you were able to have two grandfathers like that. Yeah. I've been very blessed with family. Yeah. And truly. Well, and, and I was going to say the fact that he went in through the back door and spoke to everybody and didn't go act like he was the big executive who was in this on this separate plane from them. He let them know just by his actions that yeah. he was one of them. That's so cool. Yeah. And that's where he had started in the industry was at, at the lowest level of the of the physical plant back in his yeah. early days. And he worked his way all the way up from there. Mm -hmm. up into the tower and he had no problem going back down there and, and working and side by side what, with those people he knew what they felt like yeah and he knew how important it is to not feel like you're being overlooked and looked down upon and so forth yeah. and when he retired a lot of the people from the soil room wrote messages and and mm -hmm. said things to him he said that was worth more than anything the executives yeah gave him as a as a gift yeah he said the respect uh, it was better than that. anything else. Yeah. That is so cool. I, I didn't know my, my father's father because he died before I was born. And then my grandfather died of suicide when I was five. So I knew him yeah. and I remember him, but you know, I don't have that many years of memories. And, yeah. but with my father, my father was blind. And so one of the big things that I learned from him, I literally never heard him say that he couldn't do anything. So I learned just through osmosis that you figure out a way to do whatever it is that you want to do, you know, and yeah. you, you, if you want to do it, you just do it. I, I learned that from him, many other things, but that I would say that's one of the main things. And then my mother was just always such a sweet, giving, kind person. 
everybody. So kind of like with your grandparents, it was like these two different sides that really complemented each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. My, my wife, Tina and I were talking last night about my grandmother on the French side, my meme. Aww. And the, the, just the classic thing I talk about meme, they had a, a, a small camp on a little lake here in New Hampshire, which is actually about maybe six miles from where I live right now. So I drive by there once in a while Aww. and see the old camp. It's been out of the family for 30 years, but Meme and Pepe loved it when uh, my mom had four other brothers and sisters. So they were all of the age on the weekends. They all went to the camp and they'd bring friends and people would come over mm -hmm. and stop in and they'd, you know, put the grill out and Meme didn't care how many people came over. She would make each burger a little bit smaller so she could make one more and she would put extra water in the soup so mm -hmm. that nobody ever came there and went away hungry. And no, and nobody felt like they shouldn't be there or that they weren't. Right. Well, they never even had to know yep. that that's cool. Yeah. yeah. And there was a lot of respect there. Everybody that came up there respected mm -hmm. the camp, respected the property, respected Mem and Pep because yeah. they were just such sweet, sweet people. Well, you, you're lucky because you grew up with such a great foundation, family foundation that a lot of people, even back when we were growing up, a lot of people already by then didn't have because families were starting to be dispersed everywhere. We lived right next door to our grandparents and my aunt and her family. So literally right next door. So, um, of course, I was jealous of the kids. They got to travel for Christmas and go away. You know, I didn't realize how lucky I was. But you you just sound like you have such a great background. I had a really good uh, childhood. You know, I didn't start to hit the real highs and lows until I got into adulthood and tried to figure out what the heck I want to do with my yeah. life. <laughs> you know, but it's funny. Each of the great things, you know, each time my phoenix came up out of the ashes of whatever self-imposed wily e. Coyote off a rocket, yeah. you know, rocket roller skates off a cliff uh, <laughs> that I did, there was always somebody that would show up in my life and ask me a question or two that got me back on track. And it was always at the lowest points. Oh. And uh, I've I've got some guardian angels like you read about. I truly well, tell do. us some of those stories then of, of your your yeah. depths and rising from the ashes. Yeah. Well, when I was 24, I had graduated college at 22 with a bachelor of arts in business, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of kicking around, living on my grandfather's couch at the time. <laughs> and uh, a friend of mine named Danny asked why didn't you ever get into radio he's been saying you wanted to do it since we were kids and you never you never did anything about it you always mm -hmm. play the music at the parties you know more about music than anybody you could kill in music trivia mm -hmm. and he just asked me on a day where i was out of excuses and said i don't know so i called the local radio station talked to a dj that i listened to a lot mm -hmm. so look I've, I've wanted to get into radio but i have no idea how to do it and she suggested a broadcast school down near boston oh so I borrowed $4,000 from my grandfather and went to broadcast school summer of 1992. Oh. And in September, I was all done school. And again, through that DJ at the radio station, I called up and said, now what? Mm -hmm. She goes, well, I, I know somebody at this rock station and she works there as a copywriter. Maybe she needs an intern. And I just thought, oh my gosh, it's too big of a station. It's, you know, it's a big Boston radio station. <laughs> and so she made the call and she said, yeah, come on down. I'll, I'll have a conversation with you and see if there's a space for you. Mm -hmm. It was in a dumpy little suburb in a dumpy old building in a crappy neighborhood, but it was this rock station. So I'm like, oh, I could work here. <laughs> this place is, you know, <laughs> it's just regular people. I thought it was going to be this big, huge thing. Yeah. And I got an internship, which pays mm -hmm. nothing. But I was so excited because my dad had told me, get your foot in the door and then fight like hell to never get thrown back out the door. Oh, yeah. Great but, advice. So I drove to my friend Danny's house because I hadn't seen him all summer because mm -hmm. I was living in Boston at the time going to school. And he said, where you been? I said, radio school. He goes, no. Did you get a job? <laughs> I said, got an internship. What station? WCGY, 93.7, just north of Boston. And, of course, I got the I told you so speech. You know, yeah. I told you so. I told you so. And uh, three weeks later, Danny passed away. Oh, my gosh. He'd had oh, cancer. He, I didn't see that coming. Now I am going to cry. Yeah. That's awful. He'd had cancer. It had come back a couple times. And it came oh. back a third time. And just really quickly, he was gone. And I was holding his hand when he passed away. I was I was one of only two friends allowed to stay in the room. Wow. His, his dad knew how close we were. And it took me 10 years on the radio 
15 years worth of hours because I was also DJing weddings on the weekends because I needed the money. Yeah. To get the lesson. When somebody believes in you more than you believe in yourself, listen to them because they see something in you. You may have the vision, but mm -hmm. you may not have the belief. And when somebody else believes in you hard enough to get you to get off your butt and take action, listen to them because they might not be around forever to remind you of that. So that was the first guardian angel. Mm. And I quit radio after 10 years because I was fried, falling apart. My first marriage was crumbling. And I walked away. Mm -hmm. I got a divorce. I was tens of thousands of dollars in debt, age 35, moved back in with family. Mm -hmm. And in August of 03, on a very hot and humid Friday afternoon, I had three bucks left in my pocket. And I went and decided to take out my frustrations on a bucket of golf balls at a local driving range, mini golf place that had a driving range. And I'm wow. the worst golfer in the world. I'm supremely <laughs> dangerous. So I went to the farthest tee box in the property, <laughs> up against the fence that protects the trucks at the business next yeah. door. Indented. Well, overhead, there's a bunch of steel towered power lines going mm -hmm. through. So I'm sitting there just cranking away on these golf clubs, naming each one something I was mad at, mostly mad at myself yeah, for what I did in my life. And a thunderstorm came ripping through. So I'm barefoot in the wet grass, holding a golf club over my head at one point daring the storm to hit me <laughs> under power lines. And oh. Everybody but me ran from the storm and I just stayed there smacking away. Oh. I, I hit my bucket and the buckets of two other guys who ran from the storm and never came back. Oh, man. And at the end of an hour, I couldn't even lift my arms. And I got out to my car and I opened the door and the rain stopped and the sun came out and I just started laughing. Wow. It, it was, I call it my Lieutenant Dan moment. If you remember Forrest Gump, when he's up in the crow's nest of the boat screaming at the storm, come on, is that all you got? <laughs> and the next day I was talking on the phone with a brand new life coach, also named Dan, mm. another guardian angel, who asked, how was your week? And I told him as funny as I could make it, super self-deprecating, but funny. I told yeah. him the story of that hour. And when he stopped laughing, which is something as a coach, you shouldn't do when your clients laugh. <laughs> yeah. He asked, have you ever thought of being a motivational speaker or stand-up comedian? I think you'd be great at both. He didn't know what my goals were when I was 11 years wow. old. Wow. I hadn't told him yet. And those were the only two things I hadn't done yet because I had been on the radio for 10 years. I'd been a DJ for nine mm -hmm. private events. And my first book was being written at the time. Okay. Those were the only other two. And I said, yeah, but I have no idea how to pursue them nor if I have the guts to do it. On his desk in the junk mail pile was mm -hmm. a brochure from a local community college that had a comedy class that started two weeks later. Oh. He just hadn't thrown out the junk mail yet. And That's wow. Yeah. And a week after that, my first Toastmasters meeting at his suggestion. And here we are. And that was back in the 90s, the early 90s. Uh, this part was 2003, but the oh. radio was the 90s, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. So, yeah, all these things. And I, I recently looked up what the guardian angel Daniel uh, stands for. Uh -huh. It's all about communication and excellence oh, and okay. delivering a message and being passionate, being creative and everything I've done mm. over the past, well, since I was 24 years old and got into radio. That's wild. Delivered by two guardian angels named Daniel. Both of them. Yeah. That's wild. Man. So that's when you got started in your speaking and coaching career, right? Yep. So how did you actually, once you took the course and stuff, how did you actually get started in the career, start getting gigs and clients and so forth? I just started offering myself out there for free to speak to chambers of commerce and, yeah. uh, you know, all of the different, like the rotary clubs and stuff. Yeah. I did what I call the rubber chicken circuit, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll give you dinner if you come out and speak for 18 minutes for free, which yeah. sometimes we get down to 11 minutes. Cause they had a member who just could not shut up and they go, you only have 11 minutes. <laughs> so I just started doing those. And then somebody would come up to me and go, Hey, my company brings in speakers now and then we you know, would you come in and speak? So yeah. very slowly by word of mouth, it got that out there. Such a great point because I've known so many people who really want to speak and they are like, I want to speak at all these, you know, they, they have visions of all these big places and they don't understand the easiest way to get to the big places, to the big stages is to start on the small ones because then you get your confidence up, you get all the practice up, but you're also meeting all these people and you never know who you're going to meet. So that's a perfect example of that, that you never know who you're speaking in front of, who they know. 
Yeah. And you don't want to just go from zero to big stage because right. you are not ready yet. And, and it's the same thing I talk about with visualization. It's not just what you get. It's who you become along the way. Yeah. And, and you have got to get out there. And, and the same thing I talk about when people have a podcast and I coach mm -hmm. some people on starting their podcast. Yeah. And they'll say, well, what happens if it sucks? I go, oh, don't even say if. It's going to suck. It will, yeah. Your first 10 episodes might suck. And then they get scared to do it. I said, but you realize the average host quits between episode three and episode eight. Mm -hmm. If you hit double digits, congratulations, you're successful. Keep going. One of my vision board, vision visualization coaching clients sent me a message the other day. She goes, hey, Steve, I just recorded episode 100. Awesome. That's great. In, in about 15 months, she went from zero to over 100 episodes. That's awesome. And built her own recording studio and wrote a book called ADHD oh. and did the audio recording in a day and a half of the entire book. Oh, wow. And I'm so proud of her. That's because she, had, she, she went through my vision board mastery course and then I coached mm -hmm. her after that well, but i mean I, the coaching even started because i put my own life back together and took uh -huh. notes and some people said can you teach me how to do that i said yeah uh, yeah I, yeah that's I just, the thing yeah, a lot straight of, out of my journals <laughs> yeah. a lot of people who are coaches have never gone through what they're coaching people through mm -hmm. and it's like oh say okay fine so they can tell you what to do but if yeah. they've never been through been in the trenches they don't really know. And so it, it's, it gives you so much credibility, more credibility with the people that you work with, because they know that you, that you know how they feel you've been where they have. Yeah. Yeah. And, and every once in a while I get asked and sometimes people are really snotty about it. What qualifies you to do this? Are you certified in NLP? No. <laughs> are you a licensed therapist? No. Are you a certified life coach? No. <laughs> what qualifies you to do this? Why should I listen to you? And I have a little chalkboard here in the recording studio. The The wall on the other side of the studio is, is barn board. It's built to look like the inside of a barn. One of okay. my early childhood goals as well for a creative space. Uh -huh. So I got a little $16 chalkboard and I wrote on it one day, this guy lived it. And mm -hmm. I drew an arrow and I parked my face in front of the arrow, took a selfie and sent it to them. Oh. Along with my favorite sign that's on my desk, hashtag up yours. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Which, which is better than cursing at somebody because every time I say it, I laugh and they laugh too. They go, oh, I get it. I get it. I get yeah. It. But yeah. when people ask me what qualifies me, I'm like, I freaking lived it. And well, I took and, notes. And they don't understand that a lot of those certifications, all it is is a way that somebody figured out how they could make money by offering this thing that other people yeah. can get certified through. Yeah. Not that all certifications are bad, you know. So. Right. Right. But well, um, coaching is the wild west though. I mean, come oh, on. Oh yeah. There, and there's, a, there's a person out there who created the vision board Institute. She's a genius. <laughs> I, I don't, I I've never followed her programs. I've never bought anybody's program on vision boards. I learned all of this little bits and pieces here and there mm -hmm. and kind of created my own way. Yeah. But she created the vision board Institute, which I think is, is genius in a way. <laughs> But then when people started saying, did you graduate from the Vision Board Institute? I'm like, do you realize that is her kitchen table? <laughs> that's right. And she had a Sharpie and a paper plate, and that's where she made her first certificates. Come on now. <laughs> this is the Wild West. I do what I do the way I do it because it's what worked for me. Right. And everybody, you're not the right coach, the right person for everybody out there. Oh, definitely you know, not. And, I, I, that's another thing I tell people all the time. You have to be very, very careful about any coach or mentor that you work with because working with the wrong person can do more damage than not doing anything at all yeah. uh, because you can lose self-confidence. You could do the wrong things, all kinds of stuff. But it's you, you have to have somebody that, that not only you get along with and that you like, but they can understand you and understand where you want to be. Because I don't know if, if you agree with this, but it seems to me that one of the biggest problems that people have is they don't really even know what they want to be when they grow up. You mm -hmm. know, we all, we're not raised to, oh, figure out what you want to be and do something you love. We're raised to gotta, go to school, get a job, go to work, you know, do this. And so most people are just like, I don't know. And I used to be like that too. Well, then you got these people out there and this phrase, I forget exactly who originally said it, but if you love what you do, it will never feel like work. That is the biggest steaming pile of crap on the sidewalk I, I I've know. ever heard. 
<laughs> because and I love what I do. I love yeah. being a DJ. I own my DJ business for 28 and a half years. I was part of 1700 events. Wow. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you're outside in New England at 1 30 in the morning and it's three degrees out with 20 oh. below wind chill, and you're wearing a tuxedo that was not manufactured, quilted by LL Bean. <laughs> that's not fun. That's uh -oh. work. And it's and miserable and depressing. In every that. type of business out there, there's something that's miserable and depressing about it. Even if it's just your finances, it's like, it's not going to always be peaches yeah. and cream, you know, yeah. but it's just a matter of, well, and here's the other thing, not just what you're doing and how you're doing it, but figuring out what you like and why you like it. Mm. And I think that like, for me, growing up, I always loved puzzles and I loved like word search and things like that. Anything that was solving puzzles and mysteries and stuff. And as I've gotten older, I, you know, it, I realized, oh, it, things like that really turned me on. I just love solving problems, figuring stuff out. But, but when I was like in my 20s, people were like, what do you like? Oh, no. I don't know. I mean, I knew I was good at math, but that was pretty much all I knew. And I knew I didn't want to be a math teacher, you know, and it was just like, and I, I, my degree is in accounting, but um, I just feel like it's hard for us to know ourselves. And it's interesting to me that you knew those things about yourself so young that you were attracted to those things. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't easy because of course you try to tell your parents, oh, I want to be a radio DJ. I want this. I want that. And the, what do they say? Kind of like what you alluded to earlier, get mm -hmm. a good job with a good company with good benefits, put your head down for 45 years, retire with a good pension. Yeah. That was not going to be my path early on. That's, that's the path my sister took. And that's fine because it's great for her and she's supremely intelligent. She is an accountant. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to joke back in my very self-deprecating days, like she got the brains and I got the really cool job, <laughs> but you know, that's, that's another thing too. You got to be super careful of your self-talk Yeah, because it will steal your dreams long before mm -hmm. you let anybody else do it. And that's yeah. a big part of confidence too, is, is your self-talk and your self-worth and all of those things, because it allows you to pursue what you really want to do without having that kind of ogre over your shoulder going, you really shouldn't be doing this. You really should yeah. get a real job and all that. I love what I do. And, and I'm very fortunate that I've had the support when I needed it. Like, you know, when a pandemic comes along and you own two event-based businesses and all of a sudden they completely vaporize. Yeah. In, in, in the process. Yeah. I mean, that's when I started to do Zoom calls. And, uh -huh. and now I've worn pants for every single Zoom call. I don't care what anybody else says. <laughs> I wear pants all the time. <laughs> but here's the thing. Sometimes you got to shift. Yeah. And the beautiful part about it is I knew so many speakers who said, oh, I'm not doing virtual. I'm just going to wait for it to come back. They're still waiting. Some of them. Yeah. I love That's doing this now. Mm -hmm. I, I get to sit in my recording studio that I built five and a half years ago. And I talk to people all over the world. Yeah. Every week I'm on mm -hmm. with somebody or, or doing a visualization program for inside of a company team because mm -hmm. their employees are scattered all over the country. I had a couple hundred people on a call the other day. And yeah. I got to be here talking about what I'm so passionate about, my why, and all of this. Uh -huh. And they're wherever they're at, and just getting pumped up. And I got some comments amazing from the team leaders. I couldn't talk to all those people on a stage. So now there's a way to do it that I absolutely love. So is it challenging? Yes. Is it worthwhile? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you're not spending all that time flying and traveling just to get there. And then you can you can help so many more people. In your time, you know, I've worked for myself since 1990 and I do have an office that's next door to my house because I want all the crap out of my house, you know, and we have a bungalow <laughs> that, that my office is in. But um, for years, I didn't even have that. And it's funny because up until COVID, people would act like, oh, you, it's not a real business if you don't have an office. And I used to laugh. I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm, you know, I'm the one doing what I want, <laughs> and, you, yep. you know. And then it's so funny how 180 degrees after COVID, people start, oh, yeah. And it's like they discovered this new thing. It's like, no, nah, this, this thing's been around for 30-some years, you know. Everybody's yeah. been using the internet, doing their thing. Y'all are just late catching up to the game. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I've got an office uh, in a spare bedroom upstairs on our second floor. Mm -hmm. My uh -huh. wife, Tina, has her office on the first floor of her house, actually mm -hmm. right above my recording studio. Uh -huh. And I've got the studio here. I've got three different walls that I can use for backgrounds. I've got this set up. I've got a uh, desktop computer over there, which is where I do all my audio and voiceover work. So That's cool. There are so days my the, commute is just up and down the stairs, and I just kiss my wife Tina on top of her head on the way oh, by if she's on a call. Isn't that sweet? And it's so, so sweet. in that recording studio, you have the different walls, different areas for different things within the same studio. Yeah, yeah, That's three a good different idea. background mm -hmm. walls. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, I want you to talk to people out there who are really struggling right now. I want you mm -hmm. to talk to them about visualization and help them understand how they can get to a place to change their life and how they can work with you if if yeah. they want to. Yeah. The first thing I always say to people is, look, understand if you're in overwhelm right now, I'm going to overwhelm you a little bit more. I'm going to tell you there are eight major areas of our lives. And so many people are out there saying, oh, I need work-life balance. That's only two things. Yeah. Here's how I explain it. And I use a life wheel to do it, which is a pretty common tool in personal development. Okay. There are eight spokes on the life wheel, the way I teach it. You have your physical health, your emotional well-being. Imagine that, setting goals for the emotions you want to feel. Mm -hmm. Your closest relationships, your core values that are kind of like your integrity meter for everything you think, say, and do. Mm -hmm. Your faith and spirituality, that's kind of the same thing, except the authority comes from a different direction. Whatever you choose to believe in, doesn't matter. Your connection to the world in a real way, which took a huge hit during COVID. Mm. Yeah. And then your career and your money. So all eight of these things are going on all at once. So if you're, if you're stuck on the work-life balance thing, understand work is one, life is made up of seven others. Mm -hmm. And stop thinking about 10, 15, 20-year goals. Yeah. One year. Start with one year, especially if you're new to this. Mm -hmm. Just think, where would I like my life to be in any one of these or all one year from now? Now, what you also have to do is understand and be brutally honest with yourself about where mm -hmm. your life is in each of them right now. So you've got your A and your B. Mm -hmm. Because some people just say, well, I want better and I want more. Well, <laughs> <sighs> and better and more isn't always better, right? Well, yeah, but you also don't know which direction to go for better because I don't That's know where right. you're starting. You're you're like a pirate without an X on the map. You're just going, oh, it might be over there. Arr, you missed again. <laughs> so if you know where you are now and you know where you want to be, and I, just as an example, I use physical health. Mm -hmm. Three years ago, I weighed 247, very soggy, exhausted pounds. Wow. It was during COVID. I, it's the part of my life I refer to as three deaths in a pandemic. My dad mm -hmm. died. My closest mentor and guy who built my digital business, he passed away. Oh. And we lost our little dog. Oh. And the pandemic wiped out both of my companies mm -hmm. for, for a little bit. I weighed 247 very soggy pounds because I was not eating well. I had not been inside of a gym in three and a half years. Mm. And I was enjoying an extremely tall rum and coke every night to relax and mm -hmm. make all my troubles go away. So I decided I wanted to set a goal for my physical health. I wanted mm -hmm. to stop drinking, which I did. May 4th of 2021 was the last time I had even a drop of alcohol. Mm -hmm. And I started walking. And then I got some dumbbells. And then I got some resistance bands. And then my wife got uh, a Peloton cycle for us to use. Uh -huh. Now I'm working out 90, to, 90 minutes to two hours every Monday through Friday for the past few years. Uh -huh. I'm down to 221 pounds, so 26 down. Uh, I want to get down to 198. That's my target goal. Mm -hmm. But see, every day, I would just walk and drink water and choose a, a healthy meal over a garbage meal Yeah, and stop eating fast food. So it's just these little decisions that can mm -hmm. get you a little at a time. You can't snap your fingers and get to the top of the of the hill. And if you think about it, like an old wooden roller coaster, not the jet powered ones that you push a button and you, you, you lose your, yeah. your hat halfway up, but you stop and think you start at the parking lot level, which is where you are right now. Uh -huh. Any one of your goals is the top of that first hill. What do you have to do? You have to go click, click. Those click. Yeah. click. You <laughs> can't start halfway up and you can't skip any. You have to do every single little step. And it, remember, it's not just what you get. It's who you become. Hmm. So as you advance closer to your goal, you're building momentum, you're building confidence, you're hardwiring better habits, you're becoming the type of person who's going to be able to achieve what's at the top of that first hill. 
And then when you go over and celebrate it, you hang on for a ride. You couldn't stop if you tried because you did all the work. Mm. Scream your brains out and celebrate. And when you get to the end, if you really enjoyed that, you get back in line and set your next level goal. So if you think of it that way, break it down into small, manageable mm -hmm. steps each day. Maybe you have to have a conversation with somebody. Maybe you have to learn something. Maybe you have to go watch a video or read a book or listen to a podcast. Mm -hmm. I love that analogy of the roller co coaster and the clicks. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and that goes along with my last, well, the reason my show is called Disrupt Your Now and my book, that came from so many years of hearing people say one day I'm going to do such and such or someday, or I'm going to like build this business or save all this money or whatever. And then when I retire, I'm going to do whatever. Yep. It's like, uh, you have no clue if you're going to be around. And then in the meantime, we're going to live decades unhappy. And so that's where that came from is do something now, yep. no matter how small, but to help you start going towards how you really want your life to be. But I love the roller coaster analogy. Thank you. And it was actually inspired by a true story. I was on New Hampshire's oldest wooden roller coaster at the lowest point of my life. This was June of 2003, right when my ex-wife and I, that same night we got together to decide we are officially getting divorced. And I'd promised a friend I was going to come to the chamber of commerce event at the damn amusement park. Oh, yeah. which I did not want to go to. I was in a foul <laughs> yeah. mood. And so I sat on the roller coaster at the bottom. I was in the second seat of the front car and I'm looking up at the top of the hill and I took out my old ancient flip phone and took a picture of it. <laughs> and about a year later, I started telling the story about the clicks and all that. And it's just because of that night yeah. and where my life was, which was the absolute garbage bottom. Uh -huh. That is the most requested story that I share on stage. Even for people who've heard it before, yeah, they'll say, "Hey, Steve, I brought this person. You're going to tell the roller coaster story tonight?" Yeah, I can squeeze that in. Okay, good. Well, and everybody can relate to that. Everybody's been yeah. on that roller coaster, and uh, most people have heard that clicking. Maybe the young people have it. I don't know. I haven't been on a roller coaster in years, no. but yeah, everybody can relate to that inching towards the top. Yeah, and you can't cheat it. I mean, you have got to do every single little step. You know, I've got to do every rep on, you know, it, working out down here in the basement. I've got to pedal every mile on the Peloton cycle. My goal for this year is 3,000 miles on the on the cycle. Wow. And tomorrow I'm going to pass 1,100. Today I, I stopped and I did the math. 1,099. And I look up, I go, really? I couldn't do one more mile. <laughs> tomorrow, click over the top, but <laughs> we funny. just, we keep going and going. And, and a really important thing to know also is, is to connect very emotionally strongly to a why, why am I doing this? Yeah. I work out this hard, this often and this much because as we get older, my wife, Tina just turned 56. So we're both 56 now. As we get older, I want us to be walking on a beach holding hands. I don't want us to be going to doctor's appointment after doctor's appointment. If yeah. there's something we could have done, now to prevent that you know my goal is not just 198 pounds like some people say i want a ripped body yeah G give me more than that i want yeah. to be 198 happy healthy lean flexible pain-free pounds mm -hmm. that means i stretch i do yoga i meditate i have a gratitude journal i eat well i drink plenty of water all day and i exercise my brains out every morning while listening to positive podcasts and programming and videos and that is holistic. That is the holistic view. And a lot of people that a lot of people think when they hear the word holistic, they think granola bars and whatever, crunchy, whatever, you know, and yep. woo woo. All it means is looking at the big picture, taking yep. everything into account that you can't just have one part that's perfect and let, me, let everything else go to shit. Yeah. It has to be worked on together because yep. You know, even if you like, let's say you work out one part of your body more than the other, then you end up in pain because these muscles are stronger than those and it's wet. You're all whacked out. Yep. So it, it's doing it all together. Yeah. And, and some people, when I ask them, why do you want to do this? They go, because I want to stick it up the, you know, down the throat of anybody who ever doubted me and screw them. And then I go, OK, hang on a second. <laughs> Let, let's let's find you know, I, I get that people held you down and doubted you and all that, but you know, a phrase I came up with years ago because there was somebody back in my radio days 
we were kind of on the same level, but he, he had about 20 years on me in the industry and he was kind of an ass and he was, he was really just a negative person. We butted heads the day we met. Mm. And I used to say, I'm going to make our station of the three, the best one to stick it, you know, shove it up his butt and all this and that. And then one day I finally said, you know what? I'm going to succeed despite other people, despite yeah. not to spite them. Right. Because I was getting off my game. When, when I'm coming from a position of anger or negativity or mm -hmm. just I'll show them, I'll show them. That's not the best version of me. And some yeah. people go, yeah, but you got to have that fire. I got plenty of fire. Yeah, you don't need that to, to have fire. Yeah. And here's the other thing. When you're angry at people, you're spending all this time being angry. They have no clue. They're over yeah. here oblivious. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to do it. They're like, whatever. You know, they just, yep. you're not even on their, in, on their radar. But yet you, whoever, are spending so much energy, psychic yeah. and actual physical energy. Yeah. I, I Another phrase I coined years ago. Success is the greatest middle finger with a smile. <laughs> yeah. Just succeed. That's all. Uh -huh. Just do it for you. And, yeah. and other people will feel what they're going to feel. I don't, I don't do what I do to spite anybody else. I do it despite what they think. Mm -hmm. I honestly, it doesn't matter to me. Some people say, well, Steve, you don't have any certifications. What good are you as a speaker? Oh, well, I don't know. Go read the testimonials on my page. My clients think I'm pretty effective. Yeah. And I love oh. what I do. And I love the way I do it. I'm, I'm down here in the studio with people jumping up and down on this camera, laughing, crying, cheering, dancing around the studio, mm -hmm. elbow deep in the mud with my people. That's how I coach. Yeah. And you know what? Maybe that's not for everybody. And that's fine too. If they want somebody that's got to stick up their butt, sorry, it ain't you. It's yep. somebody else. Yep. And if you're looking for somebody who's reading off the coaching Mad Libs, you know, yes. forms that, oh my gosh, it's so bad. Yeah. And, and, I still get asked, you know, Steve, well, what makes you different? I go, look, I'm just me, man. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Plato and Socrates were philosophical. Shakespeare could be comedic or tragic. And I say things like, don't let people fart in your elevator. <laughs> I paint pictures with words. And, and the way <laughs> I say things, sometimes people go, well, it's too down home or it's too simple. I said, no, no, no. All the science is going on at the cellular level in the background. Mm -hmm. This is just how I activate it, how I engage yeah. it, how I play. I, yeah. you know, how I play tennis with the law of attraction. Now I hit it and the universe hits something back. And uh -huh. <laughs> that's just how it's the dance. Yeah. I just don't explain it in such a way. I, I mean, I just explain it in such a way that regular everyday people like me can actually understand it and put it into action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it was something, I guess it was in what I posted from your bio or whatever. And you talk about helping people not only see what they want, but smell it, everything, you know, involve all yeah. of the senses. Yeah. So talk about that. You want to really connect the wiring and strengthen your connection to something. And, and that's one of the questions. I'm glad you brought it up that I asked people. I said, what do your goals look like? And they start to give me some sort of an answer. I go, okay, cool. What do they feel like? What do they sound like? What do they smell like? What do they taste like? And then usually when I get the smell or taste, they start laughing and they go, what the hell's a gold smell or taste like? And I tell a story about this. Is, oh gosh, about 12 years ago. Now I was keynote speaking at a conference. There's 200 people there all from the same organization. Mm -hmm. And somebody had said, well, you teach visualization. What's that all about? And so I said, okay, look around and goes, anybody have a car they would love to drive? And way in the back, I see this little tiny hand go up and this woman stood up and she goes, well, I'm in my early sixties and I'm retiring next summer. So I've got a dream car. I want to drive. Uh -huh. And I said, what is it? She goes, the 1974 Corvette. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. Mm. I said, all right, folks, hang on. Here's law of attraction right here. His <laughs> visualization. What color? She said, bright orange. I said, what kind of engine? She goes, the biggest one it'll take. I go, it's probably a 454 big block V8. Okay. So you want to drive fast? She goes, yep, I'm going to the beach at least three days a week after I retire. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. Uh, convertible or hard top? She said, convertible. Okay. Interior, cloth or leather? And she goes, oh, honey, black leather. <laughs> I'm like, all right. I said, what are you going to play on the stereo? She goes, oh, baby, Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. I said, all right. When you get to the beach, what's your favorite place to go to eat? And if you're from New Hampshire, you'd know the name. It's called Blink's Fried Dough. It's legendary. It's been up there forever, but fried okay. dough at the beach. 
And I said, well, just make sure you're not driving with the convertible top and the black leather interior with your fried dough with white powder leaking out the top of a fast Corvette because, uh, you know, if there's a cop behind you, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> And I said, now, does everybody get it? She's driving in a convertible very fast to the beach on a hot day. The wind in her hair, the smell of black leather interior, Elvis cranking on the stereo, and she's going to get that fried dough. Uh-huh. Everybody's like, yeah. I said, that's visualization. Yeah, because you can you can feel it, see it, taste it, hear it. Even if it isn't your dream, she's talking about it, and you're, you're experiencing it all in your senses. And yeah. when you can when you can involve all your senses in that way, you're you're activating parts of your brain that never would be activated otherwise. Yeah, you're making it real. And here's the really cool part about it. It's called the reticular activating system, which is a very scientific name for all of a sudden you start to notice things. <laughs> and you wonder how how long has that been there? Is that has that been there all the time? Uh -huh. It's like and I asked her, I said, is there a, a, a dealership around here who has that car you'd like to buy? She goes, yeah, I've had my eye on it for a while. I said, good. Grab one of your friends, go to lunch tomorrow, go to the dealership, put on your best shades, <laughs> sit in the car and put your brightest smile out the driver's side window and have somebody take your picture, put it in frame, put it on your desk until the day you retire. Love it. That's how you do it. Yeah. You, you just connect. You get super connected emotionally. You tell a story. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple of friends of mine. I've got friends who are, you know, millionaires and tens of millionaires. Mm -hmm. And one of them said, he goes, I want to have my own private jet someday. Mm -hmm. So I just reached out and asked him a couple of questions. I'm like, oh, what are your interests? What would be the first meal you'd want to have? You know, what color would it be? And all that. And here in the studio, I've got a, uh, I got the sound effects of what it sounds like sitting on the interior of a private jet with the engines idling. Mm -hmm. And I do the cockpit voice of the captain. So it's like, <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to, and I'll, put the person's name airlines and here we are on our maiden flight uh make sure you take off your shoes and scrunch your toes into the luxurious favorite color carpet uh the first meal of the day we'll be having some applewood smoked ribs and we'll be having you know all this other stuff and i'll say and to all those who doubted us we're gonna dip down low over their homes a little bit later and dump some of that blue water in the roofs of their houses so <laughs> they're not invited on the jet but hang on and enjoy the ride and I make a little video of it and I send him the video. And one guy said, he goes, bro, every morning when I get up, I listen to that. And I hear the inside of my jet and I'm closing my eyes. He goes, I'm uh -huh. scrunching my toes in the bathroom carpet while I'm brushing my teeth. <laughs> so that's how you make it real, man. That's awesome. I love you know, it. It's, it's make-believe. Jack Canfield calls it acting as if. Yeah. You know, it's one of the greatest lessons I ever got from Jack. And I'm a huge fan of Jack. Uh -huh. I had him on my vision board for years and I finally get to meet him and have a conversation, which was just amazing. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, dang, my ADD just took over because I was, you were, say something because it'll pop back in as soon as you start talking, I'll remember that's what it was okay. I was say. You know, and it just takes that little bit every day to, mm -hmm. to do it. It's like a little click. It's a little step. It's what one action. Could you yeah. take today? And at the end of each day, I do this at the beginning of the day and the end of each day. You want to give your future self an amazing gift? Mm -hmm. Write down your favorite moment from the day. And I'll yeah. tell you right now, tomorrow morning, the first thing I'm going to write in my gratitude journal is this conversation, by the Aww. way. You're going to be in my journal tomorrow. Oh, thank you. It's the greatest spark for a new day is to take mm -hmm. something. That way you're not just feeling like you're in that rut. You've got all these reasons mm -hmm. why a day was not a total loss, why it was good, something that gave you hope. I mean, I've been doing this for 12 and a half years. In the middle of a podcast one time, I happened to have one of my old journals here in the studio for some reason. I forget why. And a host said, oh, come on now. Now, something you wrote down years ago can, you know, can impact your life and you can remember it. You got so many things going on. I said, okay. I opened it up and I started laughing. <laughs> he says, all right, what memory is it? I said, got Nelly home from the garage, avoided the cops. <laughs> that was and he your goes, car. what the hell does that mean? <laughs> I said, Nellie was my dad's old plow truck. Oh, okay. Nellie had not passed inspection in years, but we got a certain type of plate that he could use it on his property, but we couldn't drive it more than 10 miles into oh, town. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. it was agricultural plate or something like that. Yeah. Well, Nellie had something break on her. So in the dark of night, we snuck it to the mechanic. And two nights later, we went and snuck it back home. And my father said, make sure you stay close with me right on your bumper. <laughs> don't let any other cars in between us because if a cop sees us, we'll get pulled over. 
because of the, the tag. First, yeah, because the tag. I mean, it, it hadn't been inspected in like three years. Yeah. Moment. First intersection, well, first rotary we get to. Who's sitting at the other next entrance of the rotary? A cop. <laughs> Who has the right of way? Me. Uh. Who waved the cop and said, go ahead, sir? Me. He <laughs> went. He says, hey, thanks, buddy. I go, you're welcome. <laughs> And I laughed the whole way home when I asked my dad, I go, did you see what happened? He goes, no. I said, there was a cop. He goes, where? I go, right in front of me. And I let him go. Oh, that's great. And I wrote in my journal, got Nelly home safely, avoided the cop. Well, talking about the, the positive thoughts and what happened the day before, too many people, all they think about is the negatives. What yeah. went wrong, how they feel bad about themselves. And then they get up in the morning and they're worrying about, what's going to happen that day. And I have somebody very, very close to me. You were talking earlier about self-talk, somebody very close to me that I love to death and all of their self-talk is negative. 100% of it. I never ever hear them say anything that's in any way kind to themselves. And I don't mean whether they're talking in front of me or whether I just overhear them. And it's really sad. And I've told them so many times, how do you expect to feel better or to be able to, you know, get out of ruts or whatever if you're spending 100% of your time telling yourself how much you suck and how stupid you are? Yep. And I'm not exaggerating. This person really does that. Oh, yeah. But then you think about that from the flip side. If somebody's taking that energy, it doesn't have to be all of it. It doesn't mean that you're all the time like, I'm so wonderful. But if you can even take 25% of it and turn it from negative talk into positive talk, what a difference yeah. that would make. It's tough because I used to be that person mm -hmm. and it was a double-edged sword. I mean, even after I became a speaker up until yeah. 2012, I was very self-deprecating, but here's the double-edged sword. I could get laughs doing it. Yeah. So I didn't see it as bad or as damaging as it was. I didn't see that it was hampering my, the growth of my speaking career mm -hmm. because I was also doing stand-up comedy at the time where you can be very self-deprecating. Yeah. It, it's kind of like, you know, you go to the circus and you see the clown all day. The clown takes pies to the face. The clown trips himself and falls down and uh -huh. gets hurt. So other people can laugh. But at the end of the show, the tents rolled up, the lights are out, the crowd's gone home and the crowd and the, clown is walking home alone in the dark sad mm. because that's all he thinks he's worth yeah and that was me for a long time and i june of 2012 is when it turned because my buddy chris he had an event and he invited me to speak for three days and on the third day i was running out of material mm -hmm. i was in a bad mood for whatever reason and i said something uh, self-deprecating and the crowd laughed mm -hmm. so i kept going and when the event was over, he pulled me aside. He actually put a, a circle of chairs and he staged an intervention on me. Mm. He said, if I ever hear you talk to or about yourself like that again, A, we're no longer brothers and B, you will never have a place on my stage again. Wow. He goes, bro, I just watched you take a wrecking ball to yourself. Mm -hmm. All the goodwill you built up with that audience over two days. He goes, Steve, they loved you. Mm -hmm. and you just wrecked it. I don't ever want to hear you talk about yourself like that again. He goes, you wouldn't let anybody else talk to you like that. He goes, man, you, you disappointed me today. Wow. And that's when I learned. Now it took a while because you don't just snap out of it, but mm -hmm. I went 5%, 10%, 20%. Now I'm at about 95% positive and not yeah. in a pat myself on the back way. Yeah. But because my brain still thinks of hysterical stuff to say. Yeah. You know, that would be self-deprecating. And sometimes if it's really good, I'll say, you know, 15 years ago, I would have said this and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll spit it out and go, but I'd never say that now. <laughs> but it, it just feels so good to rise up for that. And I do hope that your friend does see that someday because it's a learned behavior. I mean, we don't, we don't, we're not born looking at ourselves in the mirror going, look at that idiot. Mm -hmm. we're, we're taught that, or, or we've got disappointments in life. I mean, for me, it was just growing up, just not having a lot of self-confidence. And yeah. I got embarrassed in the seventh grade spelling bee. All my friends from sixth grade went to one junior high and me and one other kid went to another one. Okay. So I was in a sea of people that I didn't know. My confidence was already shaky and I got embarrassed in the seventh grade spelling bee. Mm. Because of a, a 60 year old Catholic nun with a wicked hard Boston accent who said, spell a wad. 
So I said AWAD and everybody laughed at me. She meant award with an R. <laughs> I was going to say, what is that? <laughs> yeah, she meant award. Uh, I stopped raising my hand in class. Yeah. And my grades went from pretty much all A's. I trailed smoke all the way to my senior year of college where I graduated by 62 one thousandths of a point. Wow. Because my self-confidence and self-worth were mm -hmm. in the toilet. And I didn't figure that out till my mid to late 30s. Mm. And then I just started laughing. I go, really? <laughs> I let <laughs> that right moment now. dictate the last 20 plus years. Are you kidding yeah. me? Mm. And now it's just, now it's a punchline. It's a footnote of how easy it is. And I speak to teachers sometimes. Yeah. And I'll say, have you all seen something happen like that where a student does that? And all of a sudden that's their identity. They go, yeah. I go, just be aware, <laughs> <laughs> you know? It, it wrecked me. Or I shouldn't say it wrecked me. It rocked me for a long time. Yeah. And I didn't know where it came from until one day I just happened to be thinking and I went, really? That's amazing that you put it together because, yeah. you know. Yeah. Now it's one of my most popular videos that I've shared in, in reels on social media. Yeah. You know, and the last line is my luck. I get, you know, a 60 year old Catholic nun with a wicked hot Boston accent. <laughs> and people say that to me now and I go, yep, Sister Helen's English class, a wad. <laughs> Yep. My uh, my husband went to Catholic kindergarten, and he mm. always <laughs> and he always that's only one the only I don't know why he didn't after that, but anyway, he still talks about the nuns. He's in his seventies, and he still talks about those nuns. Yeah, does he still have uh, yardstick marks on his knuckles? <laughs> yeah, he probably does. I know he does figuratively, if not still literally. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. Oh my gosh, I've had you for an hour. So. This has been great. I want I want everybody though to be able to learn more about visualization. How can they uh, how can they work with you? But if they're not ready to work with you directly, how can they learn more about you? Or do you have any like self paced courses or anything mm -hmm. like that that they can do? Yeah, if they go to visionboardspecial dot com. That's one of the pages on my site, okay. and there's uh, you just put in their information there so that it can get sent to them. There's a free video that I've got. It's called Visualize in Five. And it's okay. it's eight and a half minutes long. I made it to fit in between the nine minutes of snooze buttons in the morning. So oh, yeah, that's you, a you great don't get idea. to go back to sleep. Somebody asked, why is it eight and a half minutes? I go, because the snooze button's nine. <laughs> if you're going to be lazy and start your day, at least listen to my hypnotic voice. That's and, a great idea. Learn about the basics mm -hmm. of visualization and how you can get started. And beyond that, I've got my vision board mastery program. We're actually working on a new uh, five-day free email course, and then an entry-level program called Vision Board 101 that we're working on right now. But for now, you got Visualize in Five, and a lot of people have said they really enjoyed it. And it's so like it's said, Steve Gamlin, Steve slash what's the one that it's eight and a half minutes? Oh, if you go to Vision Board Special. Oh, that's right. Vision, It'll okay. take you right to that page, but it's part of the Steve Gamlin. Okay. Website. Gotcha. Visionboardspecial.com. I need yeah. to do that. Cause I'm one of those people that's bad about hitting the snooze button. That's okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And everything I teach, you know, it's, it's very, it's brief. It's short. It's engaging. It's, it's got humor in it. Yeah. And, and even the vision board mastery program, it's 10 modules, 10 audio modules. The longest one is only 11 minutes. Oh, okay, cool. So one of my students said, you know, I don't have time. I don't have time. So I Googled how long does the average American sit on the toilet every morning? Answer 12 minutes. I said, I'm not going to tell you to get off your butt. I'm going to tell you to get on it. <laughs> Bring your tablet in the bathroom. You can finish my program in 10 days. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> so she did. That's awesome. I love I it. Get, I get all the little, you know, she sends me the little poop emojis. Got another one done. <laughs> great. God, that's great. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, you know, when I saw that you and Rob wrote that book together, I was like, oh my God, I got to meet him. I got to get him on my show because Rob's one of my favorite people. So Yeah. And he's... thank you so much for your very kind video that you made about the book, the Unguru oh, yeah. book. Thank you. We We loved that. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Well, I've I've really enjoyed the book. So, Thank you. and tell the tell them the name of the book because I can't remember the whole name. <laughs> yeah, the name is uh, oh gosh, now I got to read it across the room. Uncensored, unfiltered, unwoo woo, unguru. <laughs> I love that, and that is so Rob. I mean, yep. I'm just like 
he's amazing. Oh, but... uh, we both have such low regard for all the gurus out there who are rah 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 buy my stuff and let me uh let me mm -hmm. put my hand in your wallet and drain you of money while I promise you the world. And yeah, Rob and I are just both blue collar salt of the earth, mm -hmm. create value for people, and we just we struggle with what's going on out there in the world. Well, in yeah, industry. there's just it's a mess. And, and, you know, we could talk about that forever, but social media makes everything worse because everybody, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm almost 63 and people my age and older, like, Oh my God, you know, they look at everybody on social media and think, I got to be like them or they look, I'm like, you haven't learned anything in all these years. All it is, all you're going is keeping up from the Joneses back and keeping up with the Joneses from back in the day to now keeping up with yeah. the whoever. And it's just, it's so hard. And, and I don't know, I'm going all yeah. over the place, but it, people are just having a really hard time yeah. uh, separating the wheat from the chaff, I guess you would say. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's it's what I call the vision board starter kit. Because every once in a while, people say, Steve, I made a vision board. I'm going to send it to you. Uh -huh. Lamborghini, a yacht, a mansion, a private jet. Yeah. You know, the honking gold jewelry and the watch and the bank vault full of gold bars yeah. and piles of cash. And I go, really? Nothing uh -huh. wrong with, first off, there's nothing wrong with any of those. I'm not right. bashing that. Yeah. But I'm just saying, okay, who are you? Exactly. You know, because that could be anybody's. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I've really enjoyed talking with you. It's been oh, great. my pleasure. This has been great. I We're like two friends sitting on the front porch. Yeah. This has been great. Yeah, it's great. And everybody, I will see y'all next week. Hold in for a second, Steve, okay? Sure thing. I'll see y'all next week. Thanks. Bye-bye.